Hello everyone, Sakuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. And on today's episode, we're going to tell the absolutely wild story of how the United States finally managed to get some leverage over China in order to try and put a stop to rampant cyber theft that had been occurring for over a decade. And unfortunately from all of that, how a Canadian couple got caught up in the mix with it and ended up being used as bargaining chips by the Chinese state. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a wild one, so sit back and go ahead and enjoy the show. First things first, though, allow me to thank today's sponsor. But do you know what might actually protect you from the digital mafia? Today's sponsor, NordVPN. Listen, guys, all I'm saying is we live in a day and age of ever-evolving technology. And while, of course, that makes it decreasingly less likely that Luigi here is going to show up in your house at 3 a.m. to break your kneecaps, it does also mean that it is more likely that his little brother is going to hack your computer through the internet and then take your credit card info to buy $300 worth of Robux. And listen, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is I don't want that to happen to you. So it is in your best interest to get yourself a VPN. And of course, if I'm going to offer you protection, then it's got to be the best. NordVPN is easily one of the fastest VPNs that you can get out there, and you can use it to open up the entire world's catalog of streaming options by simply changing your IP address. This, of course, is going to give you access to all different kinds of region-locked content that is significantly better than the, uh, the bootleg discs that Vinny sells over here behind the bowling alley. Whether it is phishing, whether it is malware, or ransomware, or anything like that, NordVPN has you covered, and you can count on it for protection. With that all being said, you should go to NordVPN.com slash history of everything because if you do then you're going to get four bonus month for free all of which is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee thank you to nordvpn for sponsoring this video and i hope that you all enjoy it over the course of the end of the 20th century, China had effectively catapulted onto the world stage economically. In only around three decades, China somehow managed to go from the eighth largest economy in the world to the second largest economy. And this is something that when you would go and study the developments, you would see how this was fueled by massive amounts of people moving from the countryside into the city in order to work in more of industrial sectors versus agricultural ones. And thus it was in that sense that China became the world's manufacturing firm. But unfortunately, there was a rather dark secret that was also responsible for of China's success and its growth. That being the massive amounts of espionage and theft of other people's intellectual property. This massive campaign of commercial espionage has affected almost every single developed country in the world, but in particular, the one that has been affected the most has been the United States. I mean, when it comes to stealing from US firms, we're talking about taking technology that ranges from anything to do with wind turbines, from solar panels, all the way to the patent for the color white, which is a really weird thing to be stealing, mind you. I mean, one of the other crazy things to happen is that when US companies have tried to turn around and sue Chinese hackers, said Chinese hackers have then turned around and hacked into the law firms and stolen the case notes against them, you know, in order to try and figure out ways around their legal strategy. Every single theft would occur would allow a Chinese company to bypass years upon years and billions of dollars worth of research and development that would be put into products. I mean, if you want to imagine this in simpler terms, what this is the equivalent of is a Chinese company is a marathon runner that rather than starting at the beginning with everyone else and running it out, they instead paid a taxi service to drop them off 20th mile and now, oh, lo and behold, they just need to finish the rest of the race. That is pretty much what they have been doing for years with any kind of research and development. I mean, over the years, there have been coordinated attempts by the Chinese state as well as the People's Liberation Army to steal every kind of technology that you can imagine from U.S. firms, going from fighter jets to ground vehicles to even the most mundane of technologies. But despite the increasing frustration and anger and everything that has been occurring over the years, every single time U.S. officials would accuse the Chinese of doing such a thing, they would simply deny it. And to be honest, at this point, American diplomats were very worried about the idea of directly accusing China of doing anything because damaging bilateral agreements for your biggest trade partner is a big no-no in the political world. So even as American companies were being outright robbed, there wasn't really anything that they could do to stop the robbery. After all, if they did so, then there's a chance that that company would then be blocked from being able to sell to China's 1.4 billion consumers, and that would not be good for anything. On top of that, it's not like China was just going to simply give up any of its military members or government members or anything like that who were accused of spying, you're not just going to give your people over to a foreign government for investigation. So if the United States government wanted to stop the spies, that meant that they were going to have to catch the spies themselves. And that opportunity would finally come in the mid 2010s. You see, my friends, it was in the late summer of 2012 that a batch of emails would come across the desk of some FBI agents, and these would change everything. One of the messages bore an attachment entitled C-17 Project Reconnaissance Survey, which appeared to suggest that there had been a long-term effort in order to secure information on the C-17, one of America's most powerful cargo planes and valuable military assets. A single one of these planes will cost hundreds of millions of dollars to actually produce, and that's not even counting the amount of research and development that went in over the years 
in order to make the plane in the first place. And it has been one of the most expensive military planes that was ever developed by the US Air Force. I mean, we're talking about something that cost approximately $31 billion to create over the course of the 1980s and 1990s. And ever since it was completed, the C-17 has become a key means by which any number of troops, vehicles, supplies, anything that you could possibly imagine could be given to the front line. It has been used in wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, to supply humanitarian aid all over the world. It has been used in everything. It is easily one of the most valuable assets that you could have. And American intelligence agencies knew for years that the Chinese were trying to develop their own cargo plane. It was something that was needed for any kind of modern army. Only now it seemed that Beijing was finally making some progress, except uh, it wasn't from their own research and development. It was from stealing things from the United States, as per usual. Essentially, they were going to try and build a Chinese version of the C-17. So very clearly, these emails that were found were a big deal, like a really big deal. The United States now had its hands on information on a functioning Chinese spy ring, and they could potentially take advantage of that. The only question was, what do they actually do with this information? So what the FBI found was that two of these conspirators, the guys that did the actual hacking, they were not in the United States or even the Western world at all. They were back in China. There wasn't anything that they could do about this. But the third one that they found was a successful businessman, a man by the name of Su Bin. And he was actually based right here in North America, just a three hour flight from the FBI's office in Los Angeles, California. You see Su, who went by the name Steven in the West, which I actually do dislike because that is in fact my name, was actually the owner of of an 80 employee company by the name of Load Tech in British Columbia, Canada. There he had two kids, both of them born in Canada. He had a wife. He had everything that you could possibly imagine that you would want, including a $2 million home. He did have a really rather nice life, and he was quoted as saying that he preferred the structure of the West because things were significantly less restrictive when it came to his business. But that all being said, it didn't exactly stop him from being a spy, now did it? You see, Sue was something in the espionage world that we would call a spotter. Essentially, it was his job to identify targets for the actual hackers to go after because he knew things within the corporate world and he understood a lot of aviation technology and the terminology that would go with it he would be able to tell who the engineers who the ceo who any of the important figures that would need to be gone after would be the people that the hackers would have to go after from then the hackers that would serve with him would use basic techniques like standard phishing emails and other things like that in an attempt to penetrate the defenses of the companies that they were going after and then after all that data was stolen from the companies it was then up to sue to be able to sort through it all and determine what was actually going to be valuable. I don't think you understand the sheer scope of what we're talking about here. I mean, all told, according to their own accounting, Sue and his colleagues managed to steal over 600,000 files related to the C-17 alone. That was over 65 gigabytes of data, which is a huge amount to take. But that all being said, the C-17 wasn't the only thing that the Chinese were going after at the time. They simultaneously managed to steal a bunch of data on the F-22 Raptor. They also managed to steal data on the F-35. All of which Sue would then carefully translate into Chinese and then send the data back to China on. I mean, these thefts are something that are going to be critical in helping the Chinese understand and copy what is the world's most advanced multi-role fighter plane. Something that cost approximately $11 billion to create in the first place. And they just, you know, won't have to do any of that. Now you gotta remember, I've been talking about all of this in terms of cost because for research and development, that quite literally takes billions. Meanwhile, what the Chinese government had been doing for Sue was paying them approximately a million dollars dollars to supply them and that was it a million versus a billion dollars there really isn't much of a competition for which is going to be more cost effective for them to do. I mean, the value of the technology and the skill that was being stolen from Boeing in the United States Air Force is almost incalculable. And it was the government of China that was doing this. No matter how it is that they tried to disguise their tracks, no matter how it is that they denied it, in the end, it was Chinese officials and Chinese military personnel that was doing the hacking. Investigators had even managed to intercept an email from one of the hackers that had a copy of their ID and in another email, email with the other guy, they even got a picture of both of them in their full military dress uniforms. It was very obvious that the Chinese state was doing this, which is going to then bring us to the question of, okay, well, how exactly is the FBI going to stop this? Well, by June of 2014, the investigative team that was looking into all of this knew that Su Bin was going to be leaving the country and heading back to China. Problem was, they didn't know when he was going to be back, if at all. Thus, at this point, they determined that it was time to act, and a few days before the trip was scheduled to happen, Su Bin was pulled over and promptly arrested by Canadian authorities. Now, China almost immediately realized that this had gone wrong, that one of their most valuable assets had been seized by a foreign government. And as a result of this, they 
basically panicked. The unfortunate reality is that when a massive authoritarian state panics, the people who tend to get caught up in it and suffer are not usually going to be the ones that are guilty of anything. They tend to be innocent. And speaking of innocence, that is precisely what happened to Kevin and Julia Garrett over here, adults who had spent almost their entire adult lives in China, and as a result of all this bickering between countries, they were going to be heavily punished. You see, the Garretts had come to China from Canada back in the 1980s as English teachers, and there they had lived in six different cities over time doing a variety of different things all the while raising four children along the way before settling in a city called Dangdong. And from the spot, they did a variety of different things. They helped provide food aid and support to people inside of North Korea. They had even started an orphanage, along with doing a lot of different volunteer work around Dendong itself. They were pretty ingrained, happy people within the community. So because of all that, it didn't really seem so odd when they were invited out by an acquaintance of a friend that wanted some help figuring out how they could get their daughter into college in Canada. Only things after that meal took a very dark turn. There was nothing wrong with the meal itself, mind you. Nothing like that. They weren't poisoned or anything. But after dinner, as the Garrets were taking an elevator downstairs to go and leave the building, when the doors opened, all of a sudden they were met with blasts of cameras and lights. Now at first, the Garrets going into this thing thought like, oh, oh, we just accidentally walked into a wedding. So sorry, we're just gonna go ahead and make our way out of here. But no, that that's not what was going on at all. Instead, some men reached forward, grabbed the couple, and then shuffled them out to some waiting cars and took them away. Everything happened just so blindingly fast that neither one of them knew what had happened. And it would be even worse because they wouldn't see each other for almost three months after the incident. What was going on was that China was retaliating. What China did at this point was try to level charges that were almost an exact copy of the charges that were against Su Bin back in Canada. The Chinese foreign ministry even then went on to tell the New York Times that the Garretts were being investigated for espionage and for, quote, stealing intelligence about Chinese military targets and important national defense research projects and engaging in activities that are threatening to Chinese national security. Gee. I wonder why. As for the evidence that the Chinese state had against Kevin, well, the only thing that they actually had was that he had been taking pictures of different places like Tiananmen Square or people who were in military uniforms raising flags or other things like that. You know, just unremarkable photos, and that was their evidence against him. Over the course of all of this, Kevin was being kept in a cell with as many as 14 other prisoners, something that was exceptionally small and he would suffer in for quite literally years. He was merely a pawn that was being used by the Chinese state in a massive political game that they were playing with foreign powers. And so then we fast forward to November of 2014, while Su Bin and the Garretts and everyone else are rotting in prison, and you have this up here. The Chinese roll out their own knockoff military cargo plane at an annual air show in Zhuhai. Everyone, allow me to introduce you to the Xi'an Y-20, codenamed Kunpeng after the mythical Chinese bird that was capable of flying long distances. The great ironic thing about this plane is that it was parked remarkably close to the American C-17, like they were directly across from each other at the tarmac. And so aviation enthusiasts that were there at the show looked at this and went like, hey, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. These two are really similar. Gee, I wonder why. But the funny thing is, even with this apparent victory by China, the reality was is that their operations, their spy operations had been compromised and the entire world was now watching them. Any further spy attempts or espionage or anything like that was going to be met with increasing scrutiny and potentially even more aggressive responses. Something that made the entire idea just untenable as China really could not afford a hit to either its international reputation or its economy. Either one would be devastating. And so in the end, after a series of meetings between delegates of China in the United States, it was on September 25th, 2015, that President Barack Obama and Xi Jinping would meet privately. And then afterwards, the president would go on to make an announcement in the Rose Garden that honestly, no one really ever expected to be possible at that point. He said, and I quote, Today, I can announce that our two countries have reached a common understanding on the way forward. We've agreed that neither the US or the Chinese government will conduct or knowingly support cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property, including trade secrets or other confidential business information for commercial advantage. In addition, we will work together and with other nations to promote international rules of the road for appropriate conduct in cyberspace. And in the end, that is actually pretty crazy. I mean, you have to remember that this is, this is a breakthrough. This is something that at the time, this is the equivalent of a international arms treaty regarding cyberspace, the first of its kind. Nothing else had really been done to this degree since. So awesome, the two world superpowers have now made some degree of peace, but what happens now? Well, unfortunately for the case of Su Bin and the Garretts, things would drag on a little bit longer. In the case of the Garretts, Julia had been released on bail, but at this time was still ordered to stay in China. And in January of 2016, Kevin over here 
it was announced that he was going to be standing trial for espionage. Now, the Chinese made it very clear that the whole Garrett case, the entire purpose of this was for them to use it as a kind of bludgeoning tool in order to force Canada to not give up Su Bin. They didn't want him going to the United States. But it was only a month later in February of 2016 that Su Bin would actually end up foiling the Chinese plans because he would give himself up and voluntarily go to the US in order to stand trial. And so it was on March 22nd, 2016, that Su Bin would ultimately plead guilty in court. Which then begs the question in the end, just how much trouble did this guy actually get in? Well, the judge handed him a 46 month sentence, which honestly is significantly lighter than anything that I anticipated that this case would probably bring, considering the billions of dollars that he had stolen in research and development. There was also a $10,000 fine that was slapped on top of that, but again, in comparison to the billions that was stolen, seems a little light. With the time that he had already served in prison, Su Bin actually ended up getting released in October of 2017 and was a free man. As for the Garretts, the moment that this happened, their whole case just seemed to immediately unravel. With there being no need to hold someone actually hostage in order to try and manage things with Su Bin, this meant that Julio was released in May of 2016. Kevin was then released that September, though at the same time, he was ordered to pay a $20,000 fine. The charges though, for espionage, nothing ever came from them. And so it was that in the end, that was it for the big espionage case. The individuals that were involved within it had long gone free and for a couple years afterwards, China really didn't do all that much in terms of international espionage, at least for the purpose of commercial hacking. But as with all things in history, things are never really that clean. Only a few years after all of this went down, China would once again be back hacking as many things as they possibly could, really stepping up their efforts in order to secure as much data and copy as many things as possible in order to progress themselves forward without doing any research and development. To this day, it is still a massive problem for countries all around the world, and in particular, it is still a massive problem for the United States. As for when the next big international incident is going to be regarding this and some kind of spying or something, I don't know. No one here really knows. But at the end of this video, I can certainly tell you that in the end, once it happens, I will be there to tell the story. Everyone, thank you for watching. This has been Stakuyi with the History of Everything Podcast YouTube channel. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Do anything you can to help support this video and the algorithm because I know from the beginning when I was making this that it was going to be a much longer one that I had anticipated that I was going to make and I usually don't make things this long. So if you like this content, if you like what you see, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and do anything you can to help. I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your day, guys. Don't forget to check out the podcast.